Welcome to High Point University's How to Land That Job series, part of HPU's commitment to fostering life skills and preparing students to render value in the global marketplace. Today's episode features Russell Wiener, HPU's Corporate Executive in Residence. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. I would love to sort of start off today. I know that today's session is about how to land that job, but uh, with you as our guest, I'd love to sort of start by highlighting a little bit about you. Okay. And so this idea of transformation, as I know you talked a little bit about today, obviously when you joined Domino's, you've completely transformed that company and did a major overhaul but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you've transformed yourself as a person from when you were in college to your first job to where you are now. Okay, got it. But how I transformed myself throughout my career is, you know, when I was sitting in your seats, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I, I, I was telling folks at the last meeting, I started as I pre-med, I was a psych major for a little bit. I was pre-law, actually got into law school, was gonna be a lawyer. And for a whole bunch of reasons, thank God, I, I figured out that those were not things that I would want to do. Um, and, and that's really, you know, when you talk about this phase in your career, it's not even about transformation. You're still growing. You're still trying to figure out what you want to do. And the thing I would tell you is, actually, the one thing you, you hope you don't have to do later on in your career is transform because you took the wrong career. Absolutely. So spend this time not worrying about making mistakes, figuring out what you want to do, figuring out, in my case, it was what I didn't want to do. Um, and then that somehow got me, um, I didn't figure out what I want to do till school was over. And I ended up doing something I never took courses in. Um, but I, I definitely knew what I didn't want to do. So anyway, just use this time wisely. You know, worry about your grades and that you want to get good grades. But I you know too many people who, at least when I went to school, they were so worried about, oh, I want to get all A's, I want to get all A's. And so they only took classes they were really good at. But they didn't take enough wide range of classes to make them good at life and good at jobs. And so just you know, make sure you explore to find out what you don't like and what you like, um, but also to keep yourself broad. So when you are in that job, you're going to have the skill sets you know, that you need. Um, so I guess that's, that's you know, kind of the beginning. As far as how to transform, you know, I, um, I don't feel like I've transformed at, at work. I feel like I've evolved. Um, and I think for what it's worth, um, that's the way to go. <laughs> um, I've always, you know, once I found out what I like to do, I've always kind of put my head down and just said, how can I be great at it? Um, I've never had to ask for a job move or promotion or anything. I've always been kind of tapped on the shoulder. And I think, um, you know, that, that, that's the best way to do it. Um, and so, yeah, if you think of it as an evolution versus the need for a revolution or a transformation, look, you may be miserable in what you do, and that, at that point, okay, it's time for a transformation. And that's why also thinking about graduate school and whether you do it and when you do it. I know some folks who kind of did it right after school, and, you know, if they knew what they wanted to do, that was great. If they didn't, then there was no place for them to go back to if they wanted to switch careers, right? So figuring out now how quick I can get through grad school, but I'm going to grad school when I know this is what I want to do, because grad school is also a way to pivot away from something that you thought you wanted to do to something new. Absolutely, and I think that touches a lot on what you've talked about a bit earlier, is that three phases of learn, earn, and return, and to really focus on that learning phase, because it's so crucial before you even get to earn, and then obviously return. Um, and so I think that that is a great sort of connection with that as well. But sort of then continuing with you as Domino's, um, obviously when you joined Domino's, they weren't in a great place. They had negative sales and people weren't really a fan of that product. And so when Domino's found you, were they looking sort of for a change agent at that time? And as that change agent, how do you build a team around you that's flexible and willing to adapt that mindset and excited to get behind this new change? Because obviously sort of change can be something that people don't always agree on if it's needed, if they want it. So how do you sort of handle that? Um, I, I guess you'd have to ask my boss what they were looking for. I don't know. 
whether they're happy with what they got, who knows. Um, but they definitely were looking for a change in direction because kind of the prior direction, you know, hadn't hadn't you know gone the way it, it should. As far as so your your question is really more how, how do you how did I then affect change? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I and again, I apologize if I'm repeating for some of you, but um, you know, business and life in general is really complex. And guess what? Everyone nowadays has an opinion. <laughs> And so you're not going to be able to take people where your job as a leader is to take others with you, right? And you can't do that based on opinions. Or you can do it for a very limited time, maybe because your title is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's always been about if, if you want to make change, it's about finding the reasons to convince people that you need to make the change. So back to Domino's. It wasn't just my opinion that we needed to change our pizza. Like, here were the facts, and mm -hmm. here's what we need to say. And we did the ad, and we tested the ad, and it's a good ad. So it's, you know, I think creating followership is doing so objectively with the data. This is not my subjective opinion. And I just said this. I was at a lunch. So no one who's at the lunch can answer this question. What's the best, what's the one thing you need um, to be a leader? You have to. No one could be a leader without this. Go! Oh, you good. you weren't even at lunch. You watched Simon Sinek, or you just knew it? Uh, after oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need followers. You can't be a leader if you don't have followers. And so, what you want to create around yourself is kind of an, an aura and a culture that people want to follow. And it's it's not that hard, but it's amazing how many leaders out there kind of lead through fear or lead through this. And that's, I'm. I'm a big fan of, you know, be the person that you would want to follow, mm -hmm. be that leader. Um, and, and, uh, and so if, if you've got the objective data and then you have the people who want to charge that, you know, hill with you, I mean, that's what you need to affect change. Absolutely. And I know, again, earlier you talked a lot about sort of courage in that leadership yeah. and just being able to sort of back yourself and support yourself and be confident in knowing that what you are doing is the right thing for this moment in time. Yeah. Um, and I think that with you especially, it comes a lot just from experience because as you- You think I'm old? <laughs> she said I'm old. Did you get that? <laughs> when you were at PepsiCo um, as their director of marketing and then Domino's as their COO and now president, you've had, this goes back to your phases, it goes back to how much you've learned over that time and how confident you've been able to come in your decisions, which I think is super yeah. crucial as well. Yeah, I was, again, I was talking about this earlier, but the, there, there are so many folks who, thinks, who think like, you know, business life is a, or whatever your career is, it's, it's a race. It, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a race, it, it is, I mean, it's trite to say it's a marathon, but it, but it, it, it really is, and so I remember Times in my career, this person got promoted before me. I was all, I wasn't happy, and I thought I was oh, I'm better than them or whatever. But in actuality, I got lucky because they got promoted, but I got moved to another area, and I really, my cross-functional knowledge. Learned, we're not born knowing any of this stuff, right? You're, you you learn it. You got to learn it at school or you learn it at work. And so, just making sure what Pepsi did for me that was fantastic. It really trained me cross-functionally, and I wasn't over-eager. You know, I, I, I know it's hard to say for, for, you know, where you're sitting, but I will tell you, the biggest mistake I see people make in careers is um, trying to get that next X thousand dollars or that next title. And um, I use this word a lot. I've seen many people get promoted to their last job, if that makes sense. So yeah, you found someone who's going to give you the manager or the VP title, but you're not ready for it, you know? And so be honest with yourself because just because you can find someone to give you it doesn't mean that that's where you are. And a lot of folks get promoted into their last job and then what do you do, right? And so you want to be, use this first phase of your career, which I call like the learn phase, knowing where you want to end up. Okay, well, what do I need as my background? And get a mentor and talk to folks and understand it's not, it's not a race. It ends up being a race, but 
to be successful, it's a long-term race, right? Absolutely. And moving from role to role throughout your different careers, how do you learn to adapt and work with all those different teams, work with sort of all of those different types of people, all of those skill sets? How do you sort of emphasize everyone's different strengths yeah. and help people maybe where their weaknesses are? How do you learn to do that across a variety of different teams and skill sets? No, that's a great, so when I, that's a great question. Um, you know, mo even though I didn't study it, I was, most of my life I was in marketing. And at one point, um, I don't know, maybe six years in or so at Domino's as the chief marketing officer, they asked me to be president of the US division. And all of a sudden I had operations reporting, I had all these people reporting to me. And I was used to being the functional expert. So by the way, when you start your career, you start as an individual contributor. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to your question in a second, but this is, I just realized something important to tell. Like, you'll, you'll start as an individual contributor, and then the first phase that you have to be ready for is going from an individual contributor to a, a kind of manager or supervisor. And lots of folks are really good individual contributors, but then when it comes time where you have to get the most out of other people, they're so used to having to do it all themselves, they can't do that broader role. And so just make sure, you know, as you, fo as you go through your career that you understand you start off, you know, individual contributor, but how do you get broader? Then you become a functional expert, and that's what I was in marketing, right? I was a, I was a functional expert. And at some point, if you're interested and if you're lucky enough, you get these enterprise roles across a lot of functions working for you. So here I am, the marketing guy with all these things reporting to me that I had never done before. Um, and I swear on my life, so I Googled the words, I Googled, it would be interesting to do it, not now, not during class. Um, I Googled how to manage people who are smarter than you. <laughs> because I thought I felt like an idiot having all these people and all these other functions who were as good in their roles as I was in my marketing role. And there's a Harvard Business School, um, that's what it's called, how to manage people who are smarter than you, uh, article. And um, basically what they said was, Whatever you do, do, don't try to be as good as that person in their role. They've got tons more experience than you are. And too many people try to say, okay, well, just because this function reports to me, I have to know all the answers. In fact, you don't. Your people know all the answers. And your job is to put what we call aces in their places, get, get people in the right area, but, but motivate and let, and let them lead. And then your job is exactly you know, what, you, what you said, which is to not tell them what to do, because again, they know more than you, is to help them understand the vision, where you're all going to, and, then, and how they contribute. And now maybe you can push them in certain areas, because for example, if someone is, you know, I, I tend to be, you know, what is it called, more of a right-brainer. So maybe I'll have a left brain person you know, reporting to me, and I can help them think a little bit more creativity, uh, more creatively, but I think, it's, it's really important to let folks manage, when you get in these enterprise jobs, where you have things reporting to you that you don't know, is make sure these folks understand that you are gonna depend on them and trust them and let them do their role, and your job is just to get the most out of them. Yeah. Absolutely, I think leveraging other people's strengths is so crucial as a leader because going into a new leadership position, you might think that everyone knows exactly what they're doing, how are you going to tell them what to do? How do you guide them in a certain direction? But being able to leverage all of those different strengths and then supporting those weaknesses, I think just continues to make a great leader across a variety of Yeah, areas. you maybe realize that. I think, I mean, you can tell me, but I think in general, no one wants to be told what to do, especially if you're the expert. I think, you know, as a leader, your, your job is to create a vision of where we want to go, and then your leaders figure out how to do it. And I think if you think about your job as the vision and their job as the how, um, and hopefully as you go through your career, you're gonna learn from people who do it the right way and people who do it the wrong way. And, and for what it's worth, I have a book, I, I, I've kept notes ever since I was, you know, just starting out my career of things that I learned from people that I wanna do and, and, and not wanna do from a management perspective. And fortunately, unfortunately or fortunately, the, the list of things I don't wanna do are much, much higher. And I read it once a year to remind myself of what I want to do and what I don't want to do. So. That's awesome. I think that's a great tip that 
I think we can all take out of the person we want to be, how we want to lead. Um, I think that's a great tip to sort of take away from this. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, another sort of idea that I wanted to touch on, as I've heard you talk about it briefly previously, is the idea of entrepreneurship. And so I think often many of us, myself included, when you think of an entrepreneur, you think of someone who strictly has built something from the ground up. But I think as a leader in today's corporate world um, and just in the world at large, it's so crucial to have an entrepreneurial mindset sort of in whatever you're doing, whether you're joining a company that has been around for a long time like you did, or if you're building your brand new company. And I know at High Point, there's a saying that regardless of your job title, everyone's in sales. Um, and so I think that sort of connects with you, like everyone is in marketing. But so could you touch on the importance of having that entrepreneurial mindset, having that mindset that everyone's in sales, yeah. everyone's in marketing? So it's funny, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Cobain and I were talking about, because he brought up the everyone's in sales, and I'm like, ah, I know you're right on everything, but... <laughs> Um, I actually think, you know, when I think of just the word sales, and maybe this is just my definition of sales, I, I tend to think of, you know, the objective there is to sell whatever it is, just to sell it. Um, and there are things that, you know, maybe shouldn't be sold that, that, you know, think of a used car or, you know, whatever salesman or... I, I think there needs to be some responsibility. And, and, and so, um, yeah, that's why I like the kind of the marketing and sales together because it's, it's, it's really understanding, you know, what it is you're selling and who it is you're selling to. So what you're doing is, 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 pur is purpose-based. It's not just your objective is sell a widget. I don't care how you do it, you sell the widget. No, your objective is to figure out what it is you're selling and find out who, who needs it and then craft that message. So it, it's, anyway, that's a, a little bit of a, I think I forgot your question though. I, oh, I'm no, so no, worried. No. <laughs> what, what it, um, just sort of the idea of like that entrepreneurial mindset oh, um, yeah. in business and regardless of whether you're starting from the ground up yeah. or if you're joining a company that's been around for ages. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's entrepreneur probably the noun that literally someone is an entrepreneur when they're doing it on their own and they don't want, they don't want to work for the man or the woman, or you know, they, they want to work for themselves. Um, and there are definitely people I know who would never ever want to work for a big company. And that's something you know you got to figure out along the way on your own. But the entrepreneurial spirit is something that every job needs to be. Basically, to me, that's you know, are you are you flexible? Are you hungry to learn more? Are you kind of you know? When you think about an entrepreneur, we have one sitting in the back right there. I mean, the, the, these are folks who, I mean, they're not gonna go to bed until they get done what they need to get done because it's their business and they're not guaranteed a paycheck, they create their own paycheck. And if you can bring that attitude, even if, you want, if you're like me and you're a, little, you're a little risk adverse to doing it all yourselves, you can still bring that entrepreneurial attitude as you can see from the domino story to, to what you do. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and sort of back to this idea today of how to land that job. Um, although you might not yourself be directly involved in that interview process, when you look at a candidate, what do you look for? Sort of how do you go about assessing them? Do you think about their previous job experience? Is it their resume, how, present, how they present themselves? How do you sort of dig through and sort through all of those applications and resumes? Yeah, well, so there, there are definitely, you know, if I'm interviewing someone straight out of, of school versus later on in the career, there are definitely different things that you look for. So maybe, I'm assuming you want me to focus kind of straight out of school? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, you know, uh, a, a few things. One is I, um, I really like broad resumes because again, I, I feel like I got to, maybe I'm biased, but I, if, if I did the same thing my entire life, how do I know that that's really something I want to do? And I think other, you know, other experiences make you, you better. So I look for a broad background. I do look for, you know, the classes. Like, did this person take a bunch of things to get easy A's, or did they challenge themselves? Because I want them to you know, challenge themselves in the office. Um, 
This is super important. Did they do research in the company? Do they want a job or do they want to work for us? And I don't care if the research makes them suggest something that we would never do. Who cares about that? They don't work for the company. But I do want to know that they've done enough research and thought about it that they have ideas of their own. And so don't go to a job interview if you're not excited enough to do the research on the company, because they'll see right through it. Um, so yeah, that's probably the, the last piece. And then you do want to get a sense of, you know, are they going to fit in the culture of your company? Mm -hmm. um, which I think, you know, if you guys don't use Glassdoor and some of the other things, LinkedIn, you know, to find out the companies. But the, the thing that I see people missing most is not doing the research on the company. And I think that's just even so crucial, not only to just show that you're interested in the company, but show that you're passionate. You have a little bit of drive under you already. Yeah. Um, show that you're willing to put in that little bit of work ahead of time, um, I think can go such a far way. And especially coming out of school, you want to make that great first impression because you only make a first impression once. Yeah. And so once you do that, you sort of have to start from the bottom again and work your way back up. But here at High Point, um, we have surveyed many, many C-suite executives um, to find out whether they prefer graduate students to come into their roles with life skills or technical skills. And the large majority say that they prefer those life skills. Uh, so if you sort of agree with this statement, or if you disagree, would love to hear on that too. Mm. But how would you go about saying someone prepares their resume to sort of illustrate this life skill? Or how would they prepare themselves for that interview to illustrate that they have those life skills? Yeah, uh, great question. You know, I, I think it's important when we think about life skills for business, we're not talking about life skills like, you know, um, big man on campus kind of <laughs> life skills, right? This is a, and, and I think. I think I'm assuming what the survey is talking about, and, and, and it, it is actually is assumptive of the other skill. I, I mean, believe me, you can't, we hire a bunch of people in machine learning. If you don't know how to do that, if you're not good in math, and you, like, I don't care what life skills, you could be you know, a comedian, like we're not gonna hire you. And so I, I do think it's, it's, maybe the way to think about it for me is, if you're assumptive that the skills are there, the technical skills are there, someone who's a little bit more technical versus not doesn't really make that difference. But there is a certain amount that you got to do to get a tie. The tiebreaker, though, is the life skills. And the life skills, to me, is um, you know, real life work experience. The thing that I can't stress enough that I don't see um, that is really, really important. And I'm sure they have lots of, you're maybe a good example of this, they have a lot of examples in schools where you can do this, is platform skills. So I'm gonna stand up, right? You know, when I, when, in whatever you do, um, you need to be, I'm standing up just to tell you what platform skills are. Platform skills are your ability to stand up and to make eye contact and tell a story and to make sure people, you're not, yeah, you're selling people, that kind of what you were talking about before, but, but you're compelling them with you know, the right data and, and, and information. And so platform skills, the ability to stand up, to be able to sit down and talk to a group of five or stand up in a group of 5,000 is really, really important, as well as learning how to tell a story, telling a story you know, just in discussing this way or telling a story through a presentation, like using PowerPoint and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think there's anything more important than that. Um, again, being assumptive that you have the base set of skills to do the job. And I think that that reminds me a lot of what you've done with Domino's, telling a story through that data, not just taking the data and saying, oh, well, our sales are negative and people don't like our pizza. You took that and like you talked about earlier, you turned that into different acts of how are you going to bounce back from this? How are you going to take that and turn it into something good? And so I think that that is just another crucial sort of piece that you have mastered and obviously are continuing to do within your own company today. Yeah, well, it takes time. I remember the first time I ever presented, I literally went in front of maybe 10 people and I, I 
can I say it? I, I, I went in the bathroom, I threw up. <laughs> I was so nervous, it was crazy. And now I do this for, all I do is talk to people. And it, and, and, and just, it, so don't get dissuaded if you're hearing, oh, okay, Russell's here saying platform skills. Oh shoot, I presented the other day in economics class and it didn't really go that well. Well, that's how you learn. I mean, you learn how to present when the tech goes wrong, when the microphone doesn't work, What's my joke when the slide doesn't, you know, doesn't move? You learn all that stuff over time. And so don't expect to be great at it. Expect to need and try to get the practice in it. Um, if you can, film yourself, um, you know, as well. So it takes a while. <laughs> and I think that obviously practice is one way that is just so crucial that you have to learn how to do these things, but because without practice, you're gonna do it once and then you might pick a few things out that you need to work on, but if you do it another time, there might be three other things that you need to work on. Um, but besides practice necessarily, do you have any other tips for maybe how students, I know public speaking and platform speaking can be very nerve wracking to a lot of people. Do you have any other sort of tips or ideas on how you can overcome that other than maybe just like the practice, any other mindset things that you do? Well, what someone told me one time is just remember 90% of the time that you're speaking to people, you know more than them. And so just take off your, take off your plate the fact that I got to know everything because you usually more know, know more about the topic that, than they do. And so that's one thing. But I think when we're so worried about, I mean, you got to know your facts and figures, but when we're so worried about every single number to the third decimal point, at least my brain can't do that and I get paralyzed. And so, you know, it, it, it's just under, just, I think understanding that is, is important. What's really helps for me, and I think everyone's got to find their own style. And so this is one of those things that, you know, um, if this doesn't work for you, find, that, that big thing is find your own style. But my style, for me, is I, f I feel like I need to be able to tell people a story. Um, I feel like if I can tell them a story, um, then, then I can teach them, they're following me, but the other thing is I know where I'm gonna go. And so if I, if I had slides behind me, I would have you know, maybe the, the, uh, a word or two at the top that reminds me of where I'm gonna go. Because you wanna naturally tell someone the story, but if, you, if you're like me and you get like a little distracted because they're washing the windows over there, how do you get back focused? Well, there's something on that page that refocuses you. Um, and so I think you know, that's the other th piece that helps is if you can be natural and you know, be yourself and tell a story, um, I think that, that helps. Absolutely. And I know today throughout a lot of your sessions, you've talked a lot about values sort of um, I know earlier this morning during the PBS interview, you talked about gratitude and how with Domino's, um, you're the first door to open, the last door to close, and just honesty and transparency. And I know on our promenade, we have a quote by Roy E. Disney that says, when your values are clear to you, making decisions becomes easier. And High Point teaches students that not only is it important to have values, but it's very important to stand on those values and be proud in those values and be strong in your values. And so when going and interviewing with a company, when trying to find a company that you want to be the best fit for, how important do you think it is that your values align with that of the companies? Um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I, I would think it's important. The interesting thing to me, this is something kind of relatively new in the workplace where I, you find out that you know, when I was looking for a job, I was like, who's going to hire me? You know? <laughs> but now folks come in and they want to say, you know, what's your stance on ESG? Where's your value statement? Where like, and, and so companies are doing their best to kind of get that stuff out there. And so I, I think, you know, it reduces your chance of error if you do that homework, you know, yourself on what they stand for. And, um, and is that something that you want to get behind or... Um, so I would, I would absolutely do the research. What, what I would say though is as, as you think about making decisions later in your career, so in the beginning of your career, it's, it's kind of like math. You know, one plus one is two. Like, you know, there are right and wrong answers for the beginning of your career. There's black, it's black or white. 
And at some point, all you're dealing with is gray. And there are two things that I think that are helpful in making gray decisions. One is, what's, what, is, what, is what, what are our values? So what would I do if I'm living by what's on that sheet of paper? Um, the, other, the other thing that I think really helps when you're dealing with a gray situation, other than your values, is a lot of people say, OK, should I do this or this? Well, if I do this, we're going to make $100 million, and da, 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 da. so let's do this, because we're going to make a lot more. When I have a hard decision to make between two things, actually, I do the opposite. I say, I say what's the worst thing that could happen? And what I try to do is avoid the more worst thing, if that makes sense. <laughs> because people sometimes only think about the best thing, but they don't understand the thing that's got the best is also could be the worst. So I, something I, I find is really helpful is actually to worry about what could go wrong. Um, so that in addition to values, yeah. Absolutely. And just one sort of final question here for you today. Um, our High Point President, Dr. Nita Cobain, talks a lot about the difference between an unproductive success and a productive failure. And my question to you is sort of how do you manage that failure? When you come face to face with fair failure, how do you find the courage to then take a risk like you've done with Domino's? Like, broadcasting all of your critics out to the world, on YouTube, on TV, how do you find that courage to take a risk? And how do you sort of come back from that failure? Um, there are two ways to deal with failure. One is to be disappointed and not try anymore. And the other is, in a weird way, to say thank you. <laughs> because you can learn from a failure, and it can make you better. I think too many people the failure paralyzes them, and they really do feel like a personal failure, and there's kind of no way to get out of that. For me, you know, I actually, some, there's a lot of folks who say, you know, you can't fail. Failure's not an option. Anyone here, failure's not an option. Um, we have a poster at Domino's that we put up that says failure is an option. So I think if you're not willing to fail, you, you can't be as successful as you can be. Now, the critical thing with a failure is, like let's say if it's something that we're doing in our business, is how do you stop the failure before it hits market? So I would want someone who's working on a project, if you know, you're working on widget A, and your job is to launch widget A, and you come to us and say, look, we have done everything we can, here's why we shouldn't launch widget A. I see that not launching, that failure, actually as a success, because you, you, you kept us from doing something wrong. And so I think you know, when you're working for companies or when you're setting up your own business, you want people to feel really comfortable that a successful answer is to tell you we failed before you hit the marketplace. <laughs> it's not just because you get an assignment. You're not only successful if it launches, if it goes out there. You're successful if, if you say no as well. And I think that sort of goes back to earlier when you talked about actively crossing things off your list. Yeah. I think with a lot of students, we get so boxed into the idea that you have to pick a major, you have to pick a minor, and if you don't stick with those, if you don't follow those through, then you failed, you've fallen behind, right. you're behind the rest of everyone else. But I think that actively checking things off your list is a great example of sort of that productive failure because you're learning, okay, well, this is something I don't want yeah. to do. So maybe I try this. But if this is something I don't want to do, then great, we move on to the next thing. And learn how to have that discussion with yourself. It's really important because when you're when you're experienced the, you know, like when I decided, hey, this major isn't what wasn't for me, my dad was pissed off. All my friends were like, oh, you're an idiot. And you're just you're feeling like a failure. And so if, try to f figure out how to have the conversation with yourself, which is, oh, I just saved myself from like 40 years of a really awful life doing something I hate. So when you're in the moment, a lot of what you hear are the voices of failure. But figure out how to have a conversation with yourself to keep yourself motivated and looking forward. I think that sort of also just connects to High Point's idea of having that growth mindset and yeah. thinking, I can always improve at something. I'm not stagnant where I am. I'm not stationary. I can always move forward. You can always move back. But that idea of that progression forward is just so crucial, I think. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. I think we have some time for any audience questions, if we have any as well. Yeah? yeah. Uh, in your previous session, you talked about the three phases of your career, um, your learning, learning, and return. What sort of things did you learn in your learning phase and still use today in your career? 
The biggest things I learned in the learning phases are, um, one, the, the functional expertise. You know, so for example, I was in marketing. And, you know, just because I did a lot of big TV Super Bowl ads, that's only one part of marketing. You need to know how to do sales projections and market research and, you know, new products and you know, all, all these kinds of things. And so I think it's really important to understand within the, within the functional area that you want, how wide can you go and what are the disciplines you need to, to do to optimize that, you know, that, learn, that learning phase. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'm letting you, because I can't pick. I don't want to, yeah. Yes, go. So you've spoken a lot today about how important it is to make sure you don't get promoted to your last job. Yeah, I use that all the time, and it scares the bleep out of people, but I want to scare you, because I've seen that way too much, and then people call me like, oh, can I come back? Sorry, we, we backfilled the job. And I, I've, I've seen it in friends, I've seen it in coworkers, so I hope that scares you away from doing something bad, yeah. So in your career, and then also just more broadly speaking for us as we plan on entering our careers, were there any important indicators or things that you found as points where you said, okay, it is now time to take out more responsibility or seek a new role to get to new elevating myself over the other moments where you decided um, maybe you should stop and hold back and reevaluate or continue developing yourself as a professional? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were... Some of it gets kind of, per, you know, I work for a public company, so I can't say all, all of these things, but there are definitely times in my career where there were opportunities open where I told myself, I, I saw it, what needed to be done, and I was like, I'm not ready for that job. Um, and I kind of took another rotation, another step, and then and what I thought I needed to do for that, and it, it completely changed. Because part of succeeding is the thinking that you can succeed. <laughs> Not because you were born as Albert Einstein, but because you have kind of the background. And so I think, I think that's, you know, without giving you the exact job, I will tell you there are plenty of times, you know, I've done that. The other thing I was saying over lunch, I think I was over, I've been talking to so many of you today, so I apologize if I'm saying the same thing. But, you know, when I, you know, I, I think I told you guys, I finally decided, okay, when I graduated, even though I didn't take classes, I wanted to be in marketing and I got a job at it an advertising agency and, and then another job at a, a different company. And then all of a sudden I got this, this Pepsi interview opened up. And I took, a, a, for what I was making at the time, a really big salary cut, salary cut um, to take this job. But I did it because I felt like there's no way I'm gonna be able to learn all of these things at the company I'm at. And you know, when you're starting out your career, that's the time to take those chances. When you're later in life and you got kids you're sending to the high point or you got a, you know, you got a mortgage, it's much, it's much more difficult. And that was the best decision I made in my entire life was taking a substantial salary cut. Yeah. During the PBS interview this morning with Dr. Cobain, you mentioned <coughs> marketing and branding and how you position yourself in a competitive environment, especially when you talk about the pizza box and when people see the Domino's pizza box, they have a specific notion or a positive connotation to that pizza box that kind of expresses the brand and the company itself. How would you relate that to our own branding for ourselves when we go into that job interview? How would we be able to kind of create that picture or create that box for ourselves and going into that interview? Wow, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, you saying before, every job is sales. And I was like saying, well, maybe it's sales and marketing. That doesn't just apply to the products that you are about, to the company you're gonna work for, whether it's IBM or GE or, you know, whatever. The actual, the, the product that's most important to sell is actually yourself. And, and their style and their substance. And you gotta make sure you have both. Um, you're not gonna get away with style alone, at least not for a long time. And I don't care what kind of substance you have, if you can't engage in a fruitful conversation and lead people, that ain't gonna work. And so really, I guess I, I think that's a great way to think about maybe your career is, at least when you're interviewing, to land that job, which is I guess what this mm -hmm. is called, right? Is you're your own, the most important product you will ever try to sell in your entire life is yourself. 
And so your job is to, to continue to grow the style and the substance. So you're not just selling yourself, right, without being able to bring anything to the table. You're selling something that people want. Half the battle when you're in an interview is knowing that, without being cocky, that the company that is interviewing you will benefit if, if you come in. Um, so. Absolutely. And I actually sort of have a question that goes off of that, but when trying to expand that substance, not just your style, how would you suggest we do that? Through experience, through understanding more of what your values are? How would you suggest that we sort of root that substance in something meaningful? I mean, everyone learns different, so figure out the best way you learn. For me, I learn by doing. Um, so the jobs, the hopefully you guys are doing a bunch of different internships, and these are internships need to be to help you figure out what you want to do long term versus to get you your first you know job out there. But I, yeah, I I just I learn a lot more through experience, and and so figure out the the way you learn best. But I will say, there's nothing more important than a classroom education, but figuring out how to use it, you're not going to figure out in the classroom. Does that make, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Just learning to apply it outside of the classroom, learning what you're applying in your marketing, in your sales class to your internship. Yeah. So you're not just sort of having this education on the side and then trying to blindly go into exactly. an internship or a job. Yeah, and it's not, I mean, I've been talking a lot about, you know, marketing and sales, but like, think about medicine. How many people want to, you know, there's this awful joke. What do you call the person with the worst grade in med school? Doctor, right? And so, <laughs> you know, the last thing you'd want is someone operating on you who only like studied and actually the first body that they're operating on is yours. You don't want that, you know? And, and so it, it, is, it is important to kind of learn the how, but then give yourself enough experience, or learn the what, but give yourself enough experience on the how so you can actually do, you know, do, the, do the job. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? You guys got both my questions answered. Like the, I'm impressed. No one ever gets those. All right. You're good. You're awesome. smart. Well, oh, yes. I want to ask you why you rather see variety Variety? Why I would rather see variety in a resume? Yeah, so I, I'm going to tell you that, that's, a, that's a great question because I, I want to be really clear about this one. What I should be saying is there's nothing wrong at this point in your life with having variety as a background. But there's also nothing wrong with saying, oh my god, this person wanted to be a electrical engineer, and they got the perfect resume for an electrical engineer. All I'm saying is at some point, you got to figure out, it's kind of like, um, you know, do you want to get married or not, <laughs> right? and you want to get married to electrical engineering, then heck, that's a great resume, right? You're proposing to that company and look at this great resume. I just want to encourage people to say that if you're not sure what you want to do, don't worry about how all these other things look on your resume. Because what you need to position yourself then as, because again, you're selling your style and substance, in version A is I wanted to do this my whole life and look at all these classes I've taken, up, right? In version B is, you know, I've fallen in love with this area because I've tried all these different experiences. And, you know, for example, for me, in my marketing classes, some of the, or my marketing life, some of the classes that I look at, because I never took a marketing class, was my psych classes were awesome and, 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 and my statistics class were awesome. And so I'm so glad you asked that because I, what I worry about a lot when I'm coming to schools is making sure people know that it's okay to explore it's also, man, if you know what you want to do, God bless you if, you, if you're going to love it. Th that's great, too. So please, yeah, I don't want to discourage one versus the other. I'm just saying both are, thanks for asking that. Both are acceptable. Absolutely, in the back. Um, going on with this question, uh, you're told that, like on the left, that our resume should only be one page. Do you agree with that, or does it not? Um, I, so... At this point in your career, I do think the answer is yes. Um, 
And, and the reason is because I know how, and this, I've worked for several companies, how folks go through the resume. And there'll be about a 30 second flip on each of these um, because you just get, get piles of them. And so what the one page will do is force you to through the job headlines. By the way, every word in your resume has to be no mistakes. I can't tell you how many resumes I've got where there's a comma off or there's a this off, there's that off. If you don't care enough about your resume, then it probably is not worth hiring you, to be honest. Really, I, that's how I look at resumes. Um, but the reason I think it's one page is because um, you really want to focus on the biggest thing, the biggest, most important things, versus if you had a couple of pages, I could see as folks rarely will get to the second page, unless it's a really small company. And you may have something on that second page that's, that's really critical. Also, you could be pithy with your words. Some jobs and some interests and some internships are very self-explanatory with a sentence or two. You don't necessarily need to tell people every single thing you did. It's, here's a job, here's a big thing. If they want to ask you more, they'll ask you more. But I think at this, at this point, that, that would absolutely be the advice I'd give, yeah. Think about if someone had like outward bound, which was like a survival. I know I did outward bound, so I know what outward bound is. No, it's that old, believe it or not. What would you think if someone had a long resume? That's that old? I can answer for me. I can't answer for the companies, but I can answer for me, and I, having done it, <laughs> um, my wife did too. Um, I think it's fantastic because um, it's just part of what's making you a well-rounded person. But the most important thing I tell you is you shouldn't care. You shouldn't care. If that's what you want to do as part of your development in this portion of your life, then that's the right thing to do. And if there's an employer that maybe would be different than me who doesn't want to see that, then you probably don't want to work for them. Right? And so I guess that would be my advice. I'm not, if you don't want to do it, I'm not saying go out and do Outward Brown or do the Peace Corps or you know, whatever. But if you do want to do it, gosh darn it, do it. And do it in a, you know, like I, I remember when I did Outward Brown, there was a lot of leadership type stuff and, you know, that I learned that I was able to apply to new jobs. But yeah, all I can tell you is do what you want to do at this point that you feel develops you. And if there's an employer that doesn't want it, then you don't want to work for them. And if you don't want to work for them, you probably wouldn't be good if you did work for them. So it's actually, it ends up being, you know, be true to yourself, you know? Well, thank you so much for talking to us all yeah. today. I know it was a privilege for me to be able to talk and learn from you. And I think I can speak for all the students as well. So thank you so much for today. Thanks, this is great. Thank you very much. <laughs>